Darwin the most revolutionary scientist ever. If by revolutionary we mean the scientist whose discovery initiated the most seismic overturning of pre-existing science, the honor would at least be contested by Newton, Einstein, and the architects of quantum theory. Those same physicists might have outclassed Darwin in sheer intellectual firepower, but Darwin probably did revolutionize the worldview of people outside science more comprehensively than any other scientist. He may be only one plausible candidate for the most important or most revolutionary scientist ever, but Darwin has a strong claim to be the most seditious. Before Darwin, it took a philosopher of the caliber of David Hume to rumble the illogic of, if a thing looks designed, it must have been designed. And even Hume, though he could see that the argument to design was a bad argument, couldn't think of a good alternative. Darwin provided the alternative. How Hume would have relished the I told you so moment that Darwin handed him. The argument to design was familiar to Darwin, for whose cohort of Cambridge undergraduates the Reverend William Paley was compulsory reading. If it looks designed, it was designed. And the more designed it looks, the stronger the argument. Looks designed means something along the lines of statistically improbable in a previously specified direction. Paley's famous watch and the vertebrate eye are both statistically improbable in that if you take their parts and scramble them into random combinations a million times, not once will you hit upon a combination that tells the time to the nearest second or that sees in full color stereoscopically and with instantaneous light metering and autofocus. We have to add in a previously specified direction because with hindsight, every random combination can be made to seem as improbable as any other. How astounding that of all the blades of grass on the golf course, the ball landed on this particular blade and no other. The reason a hole in one is so rare is that the hole is specified in advance as the target. If you specified any particular blade of grass in advance and the ball landed on it, it would be as remarkable as a hole in one, actually more so because the hole is larger than a blade of grass. Watches and eyes have their functions, telling the time and seeing respectively, specified in advance, and both are functions that are difficult to achieve. So a random scrambling of parts is exceedingly unlikely to perform either function with any efficiency. The fact that a watch does tell the time accurately, and with at least two hands to accommodate two conveniently related time scales, correctly indicates to any reasonable person that it is not the product of random chance. Before Darwin, the only known alternative to random chance was design. Everybody could intuitively see the force of the argument that Paley generalized from watch to eye and to every other part of every living body. There must have been a designer. And yet, intuition was wrong. It's the unholy juxtaposition of commonsensically true with now known to be false that singles out Darwin's great idea as seditious. Darwin discovered the alternative to chance and design that had eluded everybody, even Hume. The answer is cumulative natural selection. Provided that a smoothly cumulative gradient of improvement exists, not a difficult condition to realize, natural selection is likely to find it and will propel evolution up the slopes of Mount Improbable to apparently limitless heights of perfection, which, if you overlook the smooth cumulative gradients, you would think were too improbable to countenance. <coughs> Darwin's dangerous idea was seditious, revolutionary, deeply surprising. And yet, having eluded Hume in the 18th century and every great philosopher and scientist before him, it was an idea that came independently into the prepared minds of at least two naturalists in the 19th century, Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace. I'm not talking about evolution itself, for that idea had occurred to many, including Lamarck and Darwin's grandfather Erasmus. Nor am I talking about natural selection itself, for that too, as we shall see, had crossed other minds than Darwin's and Wallace's. I'm talking about the idea 
that natural selection is powerful enough to drive evolution in such a way as to explain everything about life, including that illusion of design that, in Hume's own words, ravishes into admiration all men who have ever contemplated them. I singled out Darwin and Wallace as the two 19th century naturalists who independently solved the riddle of life. But claims of priority have been made on behalf of at least two other 19th century writers, Patrick Matthew and Edward Blythe. If those claims are upheld, it should be a matter of some national pride that all four independent discoverers of natural selection were British. But should they be upheld? Edward Blythe, 1810 to 73, was Darwin's near contemporary. Like Darwin and Wallace, he was a naturalist and collector of specimens in the tropics, in his case, India. He really did hit upon the idea of natural selection, publishing it in 1835. But his version is only what we would today call stabilizing selection. That is, natural selection preserving the original type, not natural selection driving evolutionary change to ever new types. No wonder Blythe was a staunch creationist. He thought of natural selection as preserving God's original creations in their pristine archetypal state. He was the very opposite of an evolutionist. Natural selection, in his formulation, would amount to a force of resistance against evolutionary change.